This past week, this past Sunday, I was in uh, Grants at St. Teresa Parish for the installation of Father Keller as the new pastor there and the surrounding areas, and everything went very, very well. In two weeks, we'll do the very same thing here with Father Brown, and I'll officially install him as the um, director as well as the pastor of the cathedral, and then also as the vicar for divine worship for our entire diocese. As you know, Father Brown, uh, at the end of his studies in the seminary, uh, he, that's what he studied. Uh, he studied the liturgy, and he's, he's very, very good in it. So we'll do that in, the, in a couple weeks um, uh, for, for Father Brown. We'll do it at this, at this particular Mass. But, you know, speaking of last week, we see a bit of a shift in the scriptures from the gospel today because last week we talked about the second coming of Christ. You know, this Advent is all about preparation uh, for Christ's arrival, one an, an event which has taken place already in time, and then the other is an event that will take place at a la- at a at a later date. Not, and we do not know the time nor the place when that will happen. But what we do is we make a shift this time from the the, the second coming of our Lord to our Lord's first coming. That's what the Church wants us to focus on today: the first coming of Christ as we know, as the, as the Messiah and the King of the Jews. And we know that he was this long-awaited Savior, and many people were longing for him to come. So the second and third week of Advent, this being the second, the figure of St. John the Baptist is going to play a prominent role, and he'll give us an opportunity to reflect upon his life, but even more importantly, listen to the words uh, that he, he shares, shares with us. So the primary message we know for John the Baptist is one of repentance. It's the very same thing that Jesus says when he comes on the scene. Repent and believe in the good news. And so John the Baptist, his first words are repent. But he says, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now I think for most of us, when we hear the the term kingdom of heaven, we think about heaven. right? That's one of the last things, uh, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. We think about, about heaven. But for a first century Jew, it meant heaven, but it also meant something else. For when they heard the expression, the kingdom of heaven, what they would do is they would go back to the Old Testament prophecies. They would go back to hear what the prophets would say about this particular time. They would hear from Isaiah of the voice crying out in the wilderness, to prepare the way of the Lord. In other words, what they would do is they would automatically think this is a second exodus. This is a second exodus experience. Remember the first exodus experience, God raising up his leader Moses, calling his people out of exile and slavery and leading them into the promised land, which ended at the Jordan River. So it's interesting to see where the second exodus picks up. The second exodus picks up at the Jordan River. Got a spider up here. I don't think he belonged up around my homily. But I took care of it. Keep an eye out in the front row. But the, 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 the second exodus begins at the Jordan River where the first one left off. And it, it, be, it, it, it begins with the person of St. John the Baptist. John the Baptist, as he says, his popularity was amazing. If we look at the first century Jewish historian Josephus, you'll notice that in his writings, there's much, much more written about John the Baptist than there is about our Lord. And there's a reason for that. Because all the people had been waiting for a prophet And it had been centuries, centuries since they had a true prophet. And so everybody's speaking about this prophet who has arisen, who is preaching at the Jordan. And it talks about from Jerusalem, Judea, and and Jordan, all the regions around. Everybody is coming out to hear him, to hear him speak. Even the religious leaders are coming out to hear him speak. And the reason for that is that 
He has been raised up in the line of the great prophet Elijah. We hear how they describe how he is dressed, right? He, he talks about the, the camel's hair that he's wearing, the, 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 the belt around his waist. But what that does is it takes us back to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, in 2 Kings, where we hear how Elijah was dressed, and Elijah was dressed in the very same way. So John, being that prophet, dressing in the, in the same way that a great, the greater prophet Elijah dressed, and here he is out in the wilderness preparing the way. Or in other words, he's, he's, he's beginning that second exodus. And as the scriptures say, people came from all around to hear him because he was very popular, wanted to hear his words because they were starting to understand in his words that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. In other words, the Messiah was nearby. And so everybody comes out to see John and listen to John and hear his words. John has very, very harsh words for the religious leaders, calling them you brood of vipers. You know, you think you're okay simply because you're, because you're sons of Abraham. But he too is calling them to repentance. It's not good enough to simply say, I am this, but your life, what you proclaim to be, you have to live a life that matches up with what you proclaim to be. Similar to what we hear in, in the letter of James when we hear about faith without works, right? Faith without works is essentially dead. So if we profess one thing, it means that we have to be living a life uh, that, that, is, that is a godly life. If we profess to believe in God, it means that we have to be living a godly life. And so St. John the Baptist really calls the people to task. He's calling everybody to task, and he does so, I think, in three major ways is how John the Baptist does this. First of all, as I said, the very first thing that he is calling them to is repentance. These, are, again, are the very same words our Lord will use. And when he speaks about repentance, he's speaking about turning away from sin, turning away from the things of God, and returning to God, turning to fidelity to God. A word that we would use for that would be one of metanoia. Right? We've heard that word before, metanoia. And metanoia literally means to change one's mind. But when we speak about repentance, we speak about metanoia in reference to the faith. It means it has to be the totality of the person. So we would speak about the heart. The heart spoke, speaks about the totality of the person. It means anything that you are doing that is not of God, you need to turn away from it and turn back to the Lord. You need to have uh, that sense of repentance, that metanoia, that change of mind, and that change of heart. So that is what John is calling the people to do in order to prepare them to, to greet and to encounter the Savior, who we know to be Jesus Christ. So first of all, Jesus calls the people to repentance. The second thing that John the Baptist will, and we don't necessarily hear it in this gospel or next week's gospel, is he's calling them to humility, but he's doing it so by the example that he is setting. So he's living a, a humble life. He's modeling the virtue of humility for them. I would say St. John the Baptist's unofficial prayer is, I must decrease in order that he might increase. He is speaking of, of Christ. So I must decrease in order that he might increase. And I think for the Christian, the disciple of Christ, this is an uh, essential uh, path that we all must take. To really look deep into our hearts and say, what in my heart, or how am I living my life, which is not Christ-like? And that needs a very real death. That needs to decrease in my life so that Christ can be fully alive in me. As St. Paul would say, it is not I who live, but it is Christ who is fully alive in me. And Paul would say also, when they, people see him, uh, that, that, that he strives to, to, for the, not to simply see Paul, but they see Christ. And that is the great way through humility. And St. John the Baptist is a, a, a beautiful, a perfect little model of humility for us. Humility simply is understanding who I am in relationship to God and in relationship
relationship to my neighbor. So first of all, humility says, who am I? I'm a beloved son or daughter of the Father. And that needs to be the identity of which I live. Beloved son or daughter of the Father. Anything that perhaps we get involved in or others try to get us involved in or any sort of temptation that pulls us away from that, we want to avoid that at all costs. So that really means repentance. That means turning away from that. So humility means living in my true identity. I'm a beloved son or daughter of the Father. And as John the Baptist models for us, humility means I must decrease in order that he, Jesus Christ, might increase. And then we also know that John the Baptist would suffer a martyr's death. He suffered a martyr's death because he preached the truth. Now, he preached the truth, and he always preached it out of charity. Charity is willing the good of the other. And so he preaches the truth, and it ultimately uh, gets him in trouble, and ultimately he he suffers a martyr's death. So I think the, the virtue that John the Baptist shows all of us is one of courage. Courage, simply meaning core, heart, agere, to act, to act from the heart, right? It means to act in a loving manner. And John the Baptist did that in, a, in, a, in an amazing manner because he, he offered his life for the sake of Christ so that Christ might be made known and that the truth might be made known. So reflecting upon what John the Baptist is placing before us and why all these people were coming out to the desert to hear this new exodus experience, this new preparing the way of Jesus Christ. I believe that John the Baptist gives us three ways in which we can do that. Repentance, turning away from sin. Again, metanoia, change of mind, change of heart. Humility, truly living out our identity as beloved sons and daughters of the Father. And then finally, being men and women of courage. Men and women with courageous hearts, always acting out of love. So may St. John the Baptist intercede on all of our behalves that this let this uh, Advent season might be a, a fruitful season in which we truly prepare to celebrate the event which has already taken place in time, our Lord's birth, but also that when our Lord comes, and we know that he will, that he will find us watching and waiting because we have repented, because we are living as beloved sons and daughters of the Father, and because we have courageous hearts.